Oh, we are so blessed by all of our musicians. Let's give them a hand and thank God for their ministry of music. Okay, so we are in the series on Matthew's Gospel. Eventually we'll get to Matthew chapter eight, but we need to pick up a little bit of what we talked about last week just to set up why we have the eighth chapter of Matthew. And I want us to begin with this ancient prayer that Jesus would have prayed morning, noon, and night. Now, I wanna suggest that this would be a great prayer for us to incorporate in our own life as well. Remember, God is great, God is good, right? Or now I lay me down to sleep. Well, this prayer at the end where it says the fruit of your word, well, blessed is the fruit of our work together, or blessed is our family, or blessed is the fruit of our thoughts, or our words, our actions. I think it's a beautiful prayer. And so I wanna incorporate it as we say it today, but encourage you to think about how you might utilize it in your family as you gather around table and ask for God's blessing. So uh, the posture of the first century would have been hands up, face up, and uh, hearts open. Let's pray. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, and blessed is the fruit of your word. Amen. So, if you'll remember last week, we talked about a perspective on the way that we look at life. And we were introduced to these two Hebrew words. One is ayin toba, and the other is ayin ra'ah. And I know you woke up after getting an extra hour of sleep just so that you could say those Hebrew words with me this morning. So let's give it our best shot, and then I'm gonna ask you what they mean, okay? And it's all on the screen, so. I think we've got a better than average chance here, okay? So the first is ayin tova, let's say it. Ayin tova, and it means the good eye. Okay, somebody said Hebrew. No, okay, all right, ready? And the other one is ayin ra'ah, ready? Ayin ra'ah, and it means the bad eye. It means that we're gonna look at life and we're gonna see good. We're gonna expect good. We're gonna believe that when God shows up, something good's gonna happen. That no matter how bad life might get or how badly broken it might be, that ultimately God gets the last word and it's going to be good. That's the first filter through which we can look at life. But sadly, oftentimes, the bad kind of creeps in. Like one little bad thing happens, then another one happens, it becomes a pattern so that when you get up, you just dread when the next thing's gonna happen. And if you get that bad perspective or that bad lens through which you look at life, you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And you think that maybe there's little room for hope, if any at all. So good eye, bad eye, that's what Jesus is teaching on the mountain, crowds have gathered around him. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus says, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Like don't let the bad eye prevail or you're not going to have light in your life. You're not gonna be able to see that there's a possibility of God's goodness. Now that's what he's teaching. We talked about that last week. Then he goes on and says, do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. We're not supposed to be looking around. We're supposed to be looking up. And when we look up, we don't see judgment. We see God's love. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you for this sums up the law and the prophets. And last week, it mainly was kind of about yourself looking at the world and having a good lens through which you view it. Now, it's not just about having a happy-go-lucky attitude. Sometimes life is hard. I mean, I'll just confess to you, if I never heard the C word again, I'd be okay. But I guess that's probably not gonna happen. So my attitude, my actions, my disposition, That's what's important, how I'm going to look at it through that lens. But on this week, he's not just talking about how you and I view ourselves. He's talking about how we view others. Like, who gets to come to Jesus? 
and who is Jesus interested in. And in typical Matthew fashion and biblical fashion overall, but Jesus' way is to tell us how it ought to be and then to show it. Like this chapter is full of the illustrations, full of the people who actually showed up looking to Jesus to do something in their lives. So let's roll up our sleeves now and see who comes to meet with the Lord. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. The crowds have followed him up the mountain. Now they're following him down the mountain. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. Be clean. And immediately he was cured of leprosy. Then Jesus said, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, there's not a correlation between sinfulness and cleanliness. Jesus touching a leper made him unclean. You you don't touch lepers. In fact, lepers were required by law to ring a bell and shout, unclean, unclean, unclean. How would you like that? I mean, how humiliating. And yet Jesus didn't shy away from him. Jesus didn't back up and say, oh, get away. He reaches out and he touches him. Lord, if you were willing, make me clean, I'm willing, Jesus says. And he touches him and then commands him to go and show himself before the priest. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came and asked him for help. Now, centurion was way outside. He was a Roman or a Greek. And he says, Lord, My servant lies at home paralyzed in terrible suffering. Jesus says, I will go and heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and they go, and I tell this one, come, and they come. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does that. When Jesus heard it, he was astonished, and he said to those who were following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you, many will come from the east and the west, and will, and will take their place at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, get this. If Jesus had gone to the centurion's house, the law says that would make you unclean. You're in the house of an outsider. If he touches the leper, you're unclean. Jesus was not afraid of being unclean. But what he wanted to do was clean up the mess in their lives. There's nothing wrong with being broken. There's nothing wrong with us admitting, I'm not perfect. There's nothing wrong with admitting, I've got a ways to go on my attitude or my actions. What's wrong is when you and I wallow in it or we make excuses for it or we think we're help or beyond help. These stories are Jesus reaching out to the people who are on the fringes or way out and so far outside they don't even think there's a place for them there. Jesus looks across all of Israel, all the faithful, all the religious, and says about this centurion, I've not found faith in anybody like that is in this one because you just say the word, Jesus, and he'll be clean. This isn't magic, it's miracle. This is deep, deep faith, believing and trusting And he says, he'll take the seat at the banquet with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then listen to this. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because if you think you and I are in based on our performance, 
that's what keeps us out. Like we're setting the standard when God already has, and we can't meet the standard, only God can. And when you and I need healing, he's ready to give it. And when you and I need grace, he lavishes it upon us. But if we're gonna live by the law, we will die by the law. If we're gonna judge others, we're gonna get judged back because it's just the standard you and I will only accept, and that's unacceptable to God. Then Jesus says to the centurion, go, and it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very hour. Wouldn't you love to have faith like that? And if you were the one who was sick, wouldn't you love to have somebody who loved you and had faith like that? I mean, the guy didn't even ask. It was the, it was the centurion who's asking on his behalf. And we need to learn to have the powerful kind of faith to ask on behalf of the one who doesn't have the strength to When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Now, this was not self-serving on Jesus' part. Hey, I'll heal you. Go fix me some food. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that she was so well, she went back to the things that made her happiest. Isn't that beautiful? She was fully restored in that moment. What we're talking about is clean and unclean. And when we're unclean, what we need to do is go wash our hands. We need to change our ways. We need to pursue a heart that works towards cleanliness. Now, I don't think any of us is 100% on any of these kinds of things, but when fear begins to creep into your life, if you're not careful, fear will overtake it. It's like a weed. If doubt comes in a little place here, if you don't deal with it, it will begin to come into big places. If worry slips in down here, don't be surprised when it's over all the things in our life. This doesn't make you and I a bad person. It makes us human. You're enough. God already declared that right there. For God so loved the world each of us, all of us, and he gave his son that any of us, whosoever, not just the good people or the rich people or the young people or the old people, people. He did it for you and for me. But when religion gets in the way of relationship, it gets messy and unclean in places that were meant to be clean that only God can cleanse. When evening came, there were many demon-possessed who were brought to him, and he drove the spirits out with a word and healed the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities, and he carried our diseases. Jesus wants to identify with you and me so deeply that he will carry our diseases, all of them. That's what he took to the cross that day, all of mine and all of yours. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross over to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Another illustration of the most unlikely person, one of the most religious, now saying relationship, that's what it's about. Some have whispered it might have been Nicodemus, and it probably was because later he'll be among the ones who will carry Jesus from the cross and make provisions for his body in a tomb. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds have air air of nests. Sorry, the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now there wasn't, according to um, Jewish teaching, it wasn't like there was an impending death. It wasn't somebody that was in uh, the throes of sadness and grief. It was like, when my parents die, then I'll follow you. Jesus is saying, don't delay. We'll figure that out when that comes. But come on now. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat and Jesus was sleeping. Because that's what you do in a storm, right? Now, I've known people, in fact, I've been one of those 
For instance, that the whole, there could be a bomb go off and I wouldn't hear it. When I'm sleeping, like I'm out. And uh, when, when we've gone on retreats, I also snore. I didn't realize that. But there are others who are like, you got to go to sleep before he goes to sleep because if he goes to sleep first, you're not sleeping through all the night, you know. But Jesus is sleeping in the boat. Then the disciples went and woke him and said, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Now, let those last few words just sink into your soul. It was completely calm. When's the last time that's happened in your life? to truly be still long enough to know that God's presence hasn't left you. That we don't read God's love for us in the circumstances surrounding us that sometimes unravel. But that he is there and he hasn't left. And not only the fact that he is there, he wants to speak to the storm in your soul and mine. He's not okay with us just simply tolerating the things that cause distress. He won't take it away from you till you and I give it to him and lay it down. Now, if you're like me, You know, Sundays are hard because you have to bear your soul to be like real and honest. And there there are just these times that, here, Lord, you can have it. And I pick it up and I carry it back with me. I'm just telling you that so that if you're just like that, you're not alone. You know what he wants you and me to do? Lay it down. Lay it down. So I can pick up his love. I think we're headed into a time, not only in our nation, but in our world, where it's going to be more than just talking about Jesus, but living with and for Jesus. And he never said it would be easy, but the reward is out of this world. And you don't have to wait for heaven someday. You bring heaven right here to earth every time you do that, and you let that go. So why is it that we go back here and keep picking that up over and over again, Lord, still the storm in my soul. Bring your calm, your peace. Look at the response. The disciples were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? And even the wind and the waves and the worry and the fear and the regret and the shame and the guilt. Obey him. When he arrived at the other side of the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them was a large herd of pigs, and it was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into those pigs. And he said, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. What a crazy story, right? Like, 
These folks are out of their minds and they come to Jesus and he wants to heal them of their distress and the demons. And I don't really understand all of that, but I believe that there are just as big agents of darkness as there are angels of light. And sometimes our life can be consumed by some ulterior forces that are pulling us down because the thief comes to kill and rob and destroy. And Jesus came for us to have abundant life, so he sends these demons into the pigs. Now, this would have been somebody's livelihood, and they would have been pretty upset, even though these were unclean animals, it still was their way of making uh, a living and bringing home the bacon. Oh, no, they were selling that. That was supposed to be a little bit of fun, okay? Those tending the pigs ran off, went into town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. They were more interested in saying what had happened to this man's livelihood and pigs than they were about the demon-possessed man, but they finally get around to that. And then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. And to me, that's like the saddest part of this story because there were all these people that were unusual and unlikely and they came to Jesus and Jesus did something beautiful in their life. There was the leper who was unclean, unclean, unclean. And Jesus healed him because he was willing. And there's a centurion, heal my friend. And on his faith, Jesus speaks a word and the friend is healed. And there's Peter's mother-in-law who's got a fever and then she gets up and does what she loves to do all over again. And then they're demon-possessed who walk away and they're free. But now the whole town, after seeing this miracle, only sees the loss of the pigs and says, get out of here, Jesus. But maybe that's a little bit like the times when I'm just saying, Jesus, that thing that I laid down, that I said I was trusting you with or for, maybe I ought to take it back again. Until you and I are willing to lay it down, that may be all we have. But that's not how we have to leave here today. I don't care if it's been years or moments. You and I don't have to carry the burden, the pain, the brokenness. Because Matthew wanted to tell us, just like these, Jesus wants to touch you, me. He came to heal, to deliver, to set free. And he will, if you and I will receive it, in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's take a moment to open up the bag that you got when you came here today. There's a cube of bread, and there's a cup. Now, there is an extra wafer on the top Unless you really, really want that, let's just kind of disregard that part because I think the Hawaiian bread will actually be a little tastier. I'm going to invite you, if you will, just to take that little point and put it away from you and then pull back so that you can kind of get your cup ready that contains the juice. I'm sorry for the logistics on this, but... When Jesus gathered at this table, it wasn't the perfect people that came. It was his followers. It was Matthew and Andrew and Bartholomew. It was James and little James and Judas, not Iscariot, and Judas Iscariot. And John, it was blustery old Peter over here who had walked out on the water with him and then looked away and started to sink. And Philip and Simon 
Oh, and he hasn't been known by this yet, but he will be doubting Thomas. All there, upper room. Passover, bread, cup, bitter herbs. Reminders of the deliverance from Egypt and God's mighty hand helping the people out of their bondage and slavery. Only this night, it's all different. It's the eve of the cross. And Jesus says, this bread which we break, take and eat this and do this in remembrance, not of the Passover, but of me. <laughs> this is my body broken for you. And we might dare to wonder, how could I be invited to this table? I know me. <laughs> how do I get invited there? Before this night is over, Judas will get up quickly and go deny, betray him. Before 24 hours is out, during and after the cross, all but one will deny him. They will fall away one by one. Who's welcome? All of us. With all of our brokenness, sinfulness, the times when we're not clean, if you are willing, Lord, this is Jesus' meal saying, I am willing. Be clean. Be healed. Be free. So after the supper, he takes the cup. He says, drink from this, all of it. It's the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Just in case you've forgotten how much God loves you, this is the moment where he illustrates it. So I'm going to pray, and during the playing of a song, he makes beautiful things out of us. At a moment that you feel is appropriate for you, we're not doing it collectively, just individually within the song. Take the bread and eat it, remembering Christ's sacrifice for you, his body broken for you. And at another time in the song, take the cup and drink it, remembering his deep love and care for you, the cup of God's salvation through Christ's love. Let us pray. Lord, your blessing over this bread and cup, we ask for the bread to become the body of Christ broken for us. For this cup, Lord, we give thanks because Jesus literally poured out his life so that we might live life abundant and free now, and life eternal in the age to come. Bless these, your children, who you have beckoned to this table to come just as we are so that we might leave fully yours. In Jesus' name.
what he'll do for all of us. He'll make beautiful things out of us. Let's stand and receive these words of benediction and grace. Thank you so much for being with us in worship today. And now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Go in God's grace. Have a great and beautiful week, everyone. God bless you.